Good afternoon, everybody. You are very welcome to our webinar today. We're really thrilled. We have over 300 people registered for today's call, and we really appreciate everybody giving up your time to join us. And we hope you enjoyed today's webinar and case study. For anyone joining us for the first time, my name is James Byrne. I'm Digital Marketing Manager with Columbia Ireland, and I'm Chair of the Retail Excellence E-Commerce Committee. And I would like to say a big thank you again to our e-commerce committee, to Philip and Keelan in Retail Excellence, and our members, Mahers Pharmacy, and our partner, Core Optimization, which is Caroline, Lisa, and Alice in particular, who have kindly supported us to put on today's webinar. And a special thanks to Maeve Dwyer and her team in DPD, who have been helping us out a lot behind the scenes. Just to say one more time as well that our committee and our panelists volunteer their time. So they get great support from our own company. We get great support from our own companies to put on events like today's. All of our advertising and promotion for this is organic. There's nobody being paid. And our sole aim is to help our fellow members trade more profitably online and to learn from each other. So if you find the webinar is beneficial, uh, we would ask you, please give us a mention on Twitter. So today's webinar is number two in a series of three where we're looking at case studies from some of Ireland's best known retailers. Last week, we spoke to Wolfgang Digital and their client, Elvery Sports, about how they've used insights throughout COVID to reshape their digital strategy. And if you missed it, it's available to watch now on the Retail Excellence YouTube channel. Next week, we're going to be talking to Connor in Social Media Elite and Paul Keeley from Tony Keeley's, who's one of the biggest nursery retailers in Ireland and the UK. And they're going to be telling us how they've used social media to drive in-store sales and how they measure that. So if you're registered for today's webinar, you're automatically registered for next week's. But uh, please do share it with any friends or colleagues who you think might find it useful. So with that, I would like to introduce today's speakers. Lisa Coughlin and Alice Goodwin are digital strategists for core optimization, and they're going to be taking you through why conversion rate needs to be central to your digital marketing growth strategy and how it can influence game changing revenue growth. They're going to bring this to life with a case study showing how Maris Pharmacy, by having the right approach and methodology through paid search campaigns and Google shopping, substantially and profitably grew their online revenue. Their presentation will last about 40 minutes, and after that, Lisa and Alice will be joined by the MD and owner of Mahers, Una O'Hagan, who will answer any questions you have. So please use the Q&A box to ask any questions. You can ask them anytime throughout the webinar, and we will cover as many of them as possible during the Q&A. The Q&A will last for about 15 minutes, and we should have you on your way for four o'clock. We are really delighted to have Una joining us today. Like on a personal level, Mahers is a brand I really look up to. You know, they started as a small, but yet mighty brand. And now I think it's safe to say they're just a mighty brand. And um, they're one of the best known brands in Ireland, particularly online. And for me, they're a fantastic example of an Irish retailer who are confidently leading the way in their industry. And they're constantly innovating. Una would be no stranger to anyone here if you follow Mars on Instagram. And I recommend you do. You know, if like me, I, I think I know her a lot better than I actually do because I'm so used to seeing her on Instagram. Um, I don't know how she finds the time for everything she does. She is a former chairperson of Retail Excellence and a former member of our e-commerce committee. And she really is a fantastic amb ambassador for the core ethos of Retail Excellence, which is member retailers freely sharing information and helping each other to get better. And in this area, digital e-commerce, we're all learning. We all have a lot to learn. Um, so no better place. So. With that, I am going to hand over to Lisa to begin our presentation. And just to interrupt folks, um, we had a small technical difficulty and the first few minutes of Lisa's presentation are missing from the recording. Uh, we do apologize, those slides are included in the slide deck, which was emailed um, to attendees, so our apologies. And with that, we will jump into Lisa's presentation. Thank you. I suppose we would look at to improve your CRO is your analytics. So within analytics, it is, it's so vital as a tool from a digital strategist point, to, uh, point of view. And every business should be looking at their analytics because it's providing you with information at your hand of how people are interacting with your website. It's also a free tool provided by Google um, and it's connected to your website. So it's, it's information that's vital for any marketing strategies that are, are being planned out. As a conversion rate optimization plan, you would look at areas like your exit pages, your bounce rates, your demographics behaviors, but especially your funnel visualization. And I'll show you a screenshot of that um, in the next slide as well. 
So that actually maps out the path to purchase and it can show you where the drop-offs are. And it kind of highlights to you where the person is struggling and where you're losing most of your customers. And it can allow us to go in and apply other elements or tools, should I say, to that area to, to make it the best um, patch purchase for the customer. So here is analytics. I suppose one of the things I wanted to show here was um, a client that had, I suppose, an issue with their mobile conversion rate. So their main target market was heavily mobile influenced and um, they were a younger market and it suited the product that they were selling. But what we could see is even though majority of their traffic was mobile optimized and um, was bringing them through to the shopping basket, we were losing them on the first step. So they were struggling to get past the shopping cart. We discovered that there was all these add-ons that were being pushed in front of them. And on a mobile screen, as you know, it's much smaller. So they had to scroll at least three times down a mobile screen before they could get to the actual product that they had put into the cart. Once they removed all of this, then obviously their conversion rate increased. We could also see it within the funnel visualization where the drop off point was, which was very clear to pre present to the client, um, you know, to make that call, like to say, you know, you need to cut off the add-ons because from a business perspective, you're looking to obviously increase your average um, purchase value. But again, you, you don't want to be annoying the customer basically. So this is a fun, like, fun visualization and how it looks within your analytics once it's set up and it can show you how people, how many enter into the path to purchase and make it true to payment. So it's a very important um, tool that I would say that every retail um, company should have applied to their Google Analytics and set up. The next area we're going to look at are heat maps. So heat maps are really interesting, again, very visually strong to look at. Um, heat maps cover a multitude. They obviously look at click, which is what's happening here in this example I'm showing you for Mahers, but they also show you videos and they show you scroll maps. And they can again highlight to you like what tabs are getting the most heat and um, how many people are actually going clicking on the cart. You know, if you want to put up a special offer, they'll show where it gets the most heat you know, below the fold on any website or mobile screen, you're losing at least 50% of your clients. So you, you want to have as much above the screen. And again, this is to present to the client to show where the people are actually, where they're working at, I suppose, when they're on your site um, and what you want to present to the customer. Another area to look at is A-B testing. So once you kind of make a call, for example, on a heat map, um, if you can see that on the top right hand side, you might have a call to action such as add to the cart. And what you might think is sitting very obvious and pretty doesn't always stand out to be very obvious to the customer. Um, and again, we'd often have, I suppose, conversations with our, with our clients to say that you want to be very brand sensitive, not totally alter the look and feel of your site and put in a big massive add to cart over in the top right hand corner. But sometimes even just a change of color to an actual call to action button can, can really make the difference. And we've seen this through A-B tests that we've done and it's a very simple thing to set up. You, you would do two versions of a homepage. One you served 50% of your audience with your current uh, add to cart button and the other 50% is served with a different color variation. And then you're setting that up to track for conversions and ultimately revenue. From there, the decision is made for you. It's telling you what the customer wants, what they're reacting to best. So it's not just my opinion or your opinion, but it's for your customers. Um, and from there, you can make more strategic calls on how to manage and change out your, your homepage to make it look and feel better for the customer. Another example here of an A-B test you would have ran for a client of ours, EuroChange. And this on the left hand side of your screen is the homepage. And on the homepage, they had a yellow tab saying buy to travel money. And, you know, visually, it doesn't look very unappealing. It looks quite strong. But you had to click on that, go into another page before you done the process of actually, you know, exchanging your money. Whereas we brought that process to the front end onto the home page on your right hand side, as you can see there. 
and it actually we set it up for an A-B test in terms of conversion and it converted 17% better for them. So they've made the change out and their conversion rate is much stronger and their leads are better as well. So the next element that we would look at for improving um, conversion rate optimization is your download speed. Mobile speed is massive. Uh, we've all, I suppose, been affected by logging on to something and it's extremely slow and you get frustrated and just leave it and go on to something else. So ignoring your mobile speed is, is one of the worst things that you could do, I suppose. And from a retail perspective, um, the websites are quite image heavy. So to have all the images optimized for mobile, so it downloads much quicker, is obviously going to serve you better. And on the right hand side, just gives you an example here of Walmart that they found for when low times jump from one second to four seconds that the conversion rate declined sharply, but for every one second of improvement, they experienced a 2% conversion increase. So again, we're, I suppose, we're a world of people now who are extremely impatient, want everything in front of you now, um, and we want it quick. So I suppose the main elements to take out of it is that obviously the speed and the patch purchase to be reduced so that it's done that that purchase is made quite effectively and efficiently. You can also, again, there's a lot of free tools out there with Google. So you've got the uh, page speed insights, which is really, really good. And then you've got a competitor tool analysis, which allows you check your own site against your comp set in terms of speed and see if you're, you're winning in that area, if you're losing out, and it will give you areas to focus in on to help improve that. Um, it'll list them out that you can download them and then send them to your web developer to make the improvements there. So I suppose the best practices to look at from a CRO perspective. So like I was mentioning, contrasting colors on call to action buttons, we have seen huge increases in conversion there just to do a test on a few different areas of look and feel of your main call to action button, whether it's add to cart, um, purchase here, any of those variations, it, it works quite well. Keep um, call to actions above the fold. So again, from heat maps, we would see from scroll maps um, that 50% you're losing easily below the fold of a website. So content heavy down there, I suppose, from an organic SEO perspective, but above the fold, you're keeping your visual um, strong, your, your proposition, your unique selling points and your offers, whatever you have running above the fold for the customer. Human and relevant, relevant images are also very important. And again, in the retail space, because it just makes it more personable to the, to the client that's coming. Um, personalized landing pages. So again, if you're pushing any specific products or offers, having a tailored landing page to suit what you're trying to push out there in your messaging, and again, having your clear call to actions placed around that page is the ideal situation. Ensure you have a clear headline, again, reiterating what you're pushing out there in your social messaging. Um, add a short video showcasing the product and service. Video is, is a well-received um, part of the content, I suppose, along with static imagery. So video is really, really strong to push out. So YouTube advertising, even in PPC, and short videos, again, on your site, but again, making sure that it's all done effectively, that it doesn't affect your speed. Create urgency. So we would often find that flash sales are really good. Um, again, they want to be set up in, in terms of a strategy that you're looking at three days out in-house and how you're going to roll it out on social, PPC, and on your website. And then whether you do a 24-hour or 72-hour 72 flash, 72 flash sale. Reviews and trust marks are really important as well. Trust pilot reviews from clients, um, also their unique selling points to place across there, whether you free delivery over a certain amount, um, free samples is usually another good one. Having them up front and center is also very important. Live chat, this live chat is really good because people like to be able to contact you when they're purchasing something. Um, but also you just have to be very careful with live chat on mobile because the icon tends to take up a good bit of the screen. Um, so a good few of the platforms that provide live chat will allow you to turn it off on mobile and just have it on desktop. So you're not getting a lot of clicks which, which are just not leading to anything or not helping the customer on their journey either. 
and then reduce unnecessary form fields. So again, the path to purchase, if you've got five steps before, like from the time you add a product to the cart to the time that you actually get through to buy that product and you're looking for reams of information or repetitive information, um, then you definitely need to look at reducing that. Ideally to about three, max four is, is best practice. Um, and allowing the guests to check out so they don't have to go and fill out reams of information is also something that's really important, especially with GDPR coming in last year. Um, we find that the guest checkout is more important now than ever. Um, so just to kind of wrap up my side of it, um, CRO, as I mentioned, the best practices above are looking at your digital strategy in a whole, but you can also look at CRO for individual channels and CRO and PPC go hand in hand for the best return in your investment. So you're obviously applying money to your PPC and spend to get the best return. So we work off a CPA model. Um, but for that, again, it's not just about turning on the ads to gain traffic and clicks and, and all of that to your site. You want that traffic to be qualitative and you also want it to end up going through and purchasing a product as seamless as possible. So um, as a CRO manager, you'd step in and review your PPC campaigns. You'd look at negative keywords. Example of that is if you have, if you're selling a product for Chanel, a lovely new handbag, but pennies are doing a knockoff version of that handbag and they're pushing it out under the term Chanel as well. Then you're going to negative out the keyword pennies because you are not in the price point of where you want to be hitting the audience with your ads. They're a totally different market. And it's just allowing you better manage your spend as get in front of the right people also. Your ad copy is very important. So ad copy in terms of getting across your unique selling points. And I suppose the biggest thing for us is um, we would bid on brand as well for, for companies. And it is so important to dominate this space on a mobile screen, especially, but also on a desktop to be there in PPC for your paid brand and also organically. Because organically, you can't alter your headings or your messaging, but with your PPC, you can. You can actually alter what you want to say. So if you have a sale on or you want to announce something, you can manage that all through your brand. Um, and if you're not there, competitors are there. So it's very important to be there for, for your, your own brand. Using audience bid adjustments to increase your conversion rate, also really important um, to apply a mobile a bid adjustment um, or an audience bid adjustment, depending on your age or your location. Maximizing profitability through your Google Shopping. So again, the visuals on your Google Shopping are extremely important for click-through rate, campaign structure, how it's set up for getting your best return. Ensure your unique selling points are clear and ensuring your brand is clear. Remarketing display visuals are clear and your landing page quality is, is ready to roll. I suppose when you, when you have all the above correct and you're getting the traffic through, then obviously your landing page, once you get there, you don't want it to fail. You want them to be able to create that purchase as seamless as possible. And um, that kind of runs through, I suppose, how CRO and PPC align. But I'm going to hand it over now to Alice, um, who is our digital strategist who specializes in PPC and who manages the Mahers account. And she's going to take you through this in more detail and show you how obviously this is all effective for Mahers um, in the case study. Thanks, Lisa. I'm just going to share my screen now. So we have a lot to get through here. Um, so as Lisa said, I'm a digital strategist also a core. I specialize in the retail side of the business. So I would work with Mahers and a lot of other retailers in streamlining their accounts and their campaigns. And one of the key things um, that is part of this is aligning your conversion rate optimization and your pay-per-click advertising. So there is a lot to get through here. Um, I just remind people that the Q&A box is there. If you see something that I don't cover, feel free to leave a question and we can come back to it then once the Q&A begins. So two key things to increasing the efficiency of your pay-per-click campaigns and your conversion rate is making conversion rate um, better, obviously, and then decreasing your cost per conversion. So the couple of ways that we can do this in terms of increasing your conversion rate, you're going to look at targeting um, consumers more granularly. So you want to really know your categories, you want to know your product set, and then you want to know uh, the difference between the consumer for each of those. 
you're going to target relevant keywords across each of those categories and you're going to understand the consumer buying cycle so that you can be assured that you're targeting consumers at the correct points of that journey with the right messaging. And then when we look to decrease our cost per conversion, uh, for the, us that means working to a CPA or a ROAS model. Um, targeting uh, across Google Shopping based on margin, so making sure that we leverage the product that we have as opposed to spending willy-nilly and hoping we get a good return. Um, identifying key areas of growth for each product category and then positioning strong brands within those categories to make sure that we're maximizing um, on the return. The relationship between conversion rate and CPA is quite cyclical in that as we increase our conversion rate, we get more transactions through. And when we drive down that cost per conversion, it frees up more budget for us to increase that traffic further. So this works as a cycle. So you can see how each feed into the other. Just to touch off the consumer journey before we get into some more um, heavy data. So it's important to understand that a consumer buys, you know, kind of in a very particular way. So if you think about how you research ahead of a purchase, you hit an awareness stage where your search is quite high level. You're looking for a product in a rough category. So say, for example, that might be a pair of shoes. And as you then move into the consideration phase, that becomes more refined as you decide, I want black shoes, I want heeled shoes, I want you know, a pair of runners. And then as you move to purchase, you might decide on a particular retailer or brand. Um, so it's key that you target each of these stages differently for the consumer. So in that awareness stage, our keywords are gonna be very different. We're gonna to wanna to push price points, we're gonna to wanna to push range, and then as that consumer moves into the consideration phase, we want to understand what exactly they're looking for, what that refinement is, target that, but then also push the brand through our service offering, our delivery, our warranty. And then as they come back to purchase, be there for brand and be there with remarketing to stay front of mind. And then there's the post-purchase stage where we're remarketing. You might have something that you're expecting, a subscription purchase or a supplement that you may want to go back out to them with messaging after, um, after the conversion has taken place. So it's key to understand this part of the journey also. Sorry, Alice, sorry to interrupt you. I think your slides are not moving forward. Oh, they're we're, moving we're still on the, the core optimization slide. You're missing all the good stuff. <laughs> okay. I thought here. I was imagining it for a second. Sorry about this folks, just bear with us. Can you see uh, audiences here? Yes. Perfect. And is it moving? Yeah, moving now. Perfect. Super. Okay. Um, so moving into audiences, um, Google has a number of different audiences that we can leverage when we remarket um, or when we target consumers at a higher level of the funnel also. I'm going to touch just on two of these because as you can see, there are quite a number. Um, so the two that we use really heavily would be in-market audiences, which are consumers that Google has identified as expressing an interest in a particular category. This doesn't mean that they've been to your website. It just means that they are starting to search for products within a particular category or service. And then remarketing audiences. And in our case, we use website audiences quite heavily. So these are customers who have been to your website. We have then captured that data within a particular category audience and then we've remarket to them based on their stage in the consumer journey towards purchase. So if we look at a sample campaign here, this is Patricia who owns a home appliance store and she's decided that she wants to start selling, I would put more of a focus on her washing machine category um, and she wants to do that through PPC advertising. So some of the strengths that Patricia has coming into this is that she understands that key moments in life dictate purchases. So with a product like this, it's really important that we identify this isn't something someone is buying for fun. Um, so the messaging is going to be very different. If someone's buying a washing machine, they probably need it quite quickly. Um, she wants to target families. So then that gives another specification in terms of the requirement there. Uh, we're going to be looking at load weights. We're going to be looking at capacity. Um, and then she knows that she wants to use audiences to streamline her budget and make the most out of it by getting in front of consumers who are more likely to convert. So when we look at how we understand our audience, 
Patricia has noticed um, that a lot of families are concerned about capacity, but she's also noticed that a lot of the people shopping for this category are women between the ages of 35 and 44. So she's going to put a lot of her budget waiting here. And she's also seen that price point is really important to consumers. They don't want to invest more than they have to here. So she's going to ensure that her ad copy is targeting that requirement and making the most of it. Um, when she looks to personalize her messaging, so we have two sample ads here. Um, the first one is one that we would see on a lot of new accounts or in-house retailer accounts that, that come in. Um, and it's this kind of one, one ad or one campaign across the board. So it's a home appliance store ad. It covers your home delivery and click and collect options and it covers your categories. Uh, but there's nothing here that's going to appeal to my needs as a consumer who's shopping for a washing machine specifically. So Patricia decides that she's going to change up her ad copy uh, she's going to make a category led, so she's referencing washing machines specifically. She's going to give a specific from pricing, um, and you'll see this as we, in a competitive marketplace like this, that that's going to be really vital, that you want to be seen to be as affordable as the other brands out there and the other retailers. Um, she's giving messaging around ease of access and reassurance that delivery is available, expert installation is available, and you could also look here to include things like warranty messaging. Um, and that um, she references also the capacity that up to 10 kg models are available. So you can see here how she has uh, worked to really refine that messaging to speak directly to the consumer that she's trying to speak to. She also then is looking to build out audiences based on the category. So as she targets in-market audiences, these generic Google audiences of people who've expressed an interest in that category, she attracts that traffic and generates new audiences of people who have been to the website. And the key thing here is we know that they're familiar with the brand and they've very, very likely seen service messaging and they're going to be more receptive to an ad later down the line as they continue to price compare and shop around. So it's vital at this point that we retarget them in order to convert them later down the line. When to retarget them is really important. Um, and we can see here there is data available through analytics on those key points. Um, and that's things like days to purchase and sessions to purchase. And this is very wide, wildly based on your product set. If you're selling something that's a very low ARP, um, around five or six euro, you're likely going to see one day or one or two sessions to purchase there because it's not a very high consideration area. Uh, but the higher that ARP goes and the more you're asking a consumer to invest in your brand or in your, um, in your outlet, the higher those numbers will be because people are going to shop around and make sure that they're getting the absolute best deal. So this is a sample from, from another account of ours where we identified that around three to four sessions was a real peak for us um, in terms of remarketing. So we know that once someone had visited or had three or four sessions on the site, that they were more likely to convert at that stage. Um, so we can then create an audience around that and retarget at that point to make sure we're front of mind as a brand at those key moments. Ensuring profitability then obviously is core to any retail campaign. Um, and there's a few ways of doing that. So we wanna make sure that we're leveraging margin all the time. Um, by doing this, we're splitting product groups out into higher low margin areas. And we're understanding the competition level of that category um, within the market. So if you've got a number of other retailers competing for space, it's important to understand you know, that that's gonna drive competition levels up and you need to be a little bit smarter about your investment to make sure that you're getting, um, getting consumers and conversions at a return that is profitable for you. Um, then identifying that return on ad spend goal or ROAS. Um, so you need to identify a ROAS goal that's gonna make sense both in terms of your margin and the market. So balancing those is really important. Uh, profitability is also always key, but you know sometimes you need to be realistic about the market you're playing in. And then monitoring ROAS, which is profitable return on ad spend. So this is bringing your margin into it and making sure that the money that you're spending and the re revenue that you're seeing in return is actually profitable for you. That margin isn't eating that up. So the learnings that we have here, the key things that we understand our audience, that's knowing our keywords, uh, your consumer requirements and your key demographics. Personalizing your messaging, so targeting consumer needs, representing your own USPs and reassuring the consumer. Building out audiences and remarketing, so capturing web visit audiences, retargeting at a product or category level and being aware of your conversion peaks. 
and ensuring profitability by prioritizing high margin products, choosing realistic ROAS goals and monitoring your ROAS. Two key things here that are really important um, and that will make life much, much easier are using some automated bidding strategies. So Google has some pretty smart tools that allow us to set either cost per acquisition or ROAS goals for campaigns, and that helps us to ensure profitability. So if you were a retailer who had a lot of products at a very similar ARP and a very similar margin, going for a CPA model would make a lot of sense. Um, because setting that, that would be a, a monetary acquisition cost per conversion, and that will simplify things. Whereas if you have a lot of variation in your margin and your ARPs, um, going for ROAS is going to make it easier for you to maintain profitability. Um, another great tool we have is Smart Shopping. So this is um, a lot of a lot of people now will be familiar with Google Shopping. This is Google Shopping 2.0, where we can basically target all parts of um, the Google network through Google Shopping. So that's going to be in your search um, as your standard shopping ads, then also through display YouTube and Gmail as um, as display ads. And there's automated remarketing as a part of that. So that was a key, and um, that's a key tool that we now use just to maximize our reach, uh, but also to be able to use those automated bidding tools with shopping and remarketing built in and make the whole thing work an awful lot harder for us. Um, another key consideration um, to make if you are going to start using Google Shopping or you want to, I suppose, optimize your website with Google Shopping in mind is to look at building out a dynamic feed for your site. And the benefits to that are you're going to be able to automatically pull out of stock uh, products, price changes, margin changes, um, with no input required in terms of actually updating your feed. And anyone who's updated a Google Shopping feed manually will know what a relief that is. So um, that's something if you are in the process of building out a new website or you're starting to, I suppose, do a little bit of thinking about, about building a new website in the future, um, this is something to definitely consider building it with it because it's going to make life an awful lot easier. Um, then looking specifically at profitability through smart shopping. So one thing that we do here is split it by margin. So we'll um, take a feed, split that either through a custom label or through two separate feeds into high and low margin feeds. Um, and set each of those a separate ROAS goal. So I have a sample of what that would look like here. So um, for a high margin campaign, we're saying our margin is about 40% um, and a low margin campaign with a margin of 20%. And each of those, the cost that we're investing here, the spend we're investing is a thousand euro. And we have identified two separate ROAS goals for this. So for the higher margin campaign, we have the freedom to set a slightly lower ROAS goal to give us a bit more scope. And um, that will allow us to spend a bit more, um, but we will pay a little bit more for that conversion at the end of the day. And you can see here, based on that ROAS goal, we brought in revenue of 5,000 euro. Um, for the lower margin campaign, our ROAS is 800, so it's slightly tighter. Uh, we're gonna pay a little bit less for that conversion due to the margin restrictions. Um, but we're bringing 8,000 euro of revenue in due to that. However, when we take the profitable return in, it becomes very clear what one is worth our while uh, pursuing over the other. So our profitable return for the high margin is 2,000, uh, but for the low margin is 3,000 or 1,600, and there's 3,000 in the difference in revenue there. So you can really see the impact um, that margin is gonna have and why it's so important to look at your profitable return when you're analyzing the success of your campaigns. So I'm gonna move now into the Mahers case study. Um, so the work we did with, with Mahers was really around um, optimizing their account and their campaigns throughout lockdown and throughout COVID-19. Um, so Mahers are a very well-known pharmacy in Ireland. Um, they were founded in 1921. They have nine bricks and mortar store and one e-commerce website. And the challenges that we faced over the last couple of months, obviously um, COVID-19, which led to reduced footfall in bricks and mortar and an increased focus online, both obviously from government advice and from the retailer themselves. Um, changing demand and stock levels obviously were a restriction. Um, every retailer during this period will know, you know that, that stock was an issue, suppliers were unreliable. Um, so that was obviously a challenge. 
and then ensuring we were adapting budget to capitalize on the opportunity that was there and there was a couple of ways that we did this so we used a flexible paid search model that allowed us to adapt to changing times we did a lot of demand planning which is key to any changing circumstance like this um, and that included monitoring and reacting to peaks in demand, forecasting and reviewing changes in demand in markets that were in a more advanced stage of lockdown. Uh, we then matched those opportunities with strong brand pop propositions. We looked to optimize margin and CPA, expand a top of funnel search and utilized audience to increase conversion rate. So the forecasting that we do, um, we work very closely with Google themselves as a premier partner. So we do get a lot of data from them on particular markets. Um, and we also would then leverage heavily Google Trends and Keyword Planner. So Google Trends will give us an indication of peaks in certain categories um, that we can see where that traffic is starting to shift. Um, and Keyword Planner will then identify high volume keywords within that category that we can look to target. So these leverage there are these insights we can then leverage across search and shopping, um, but also to inform budget weighting across different categories and to show us what categories we're likely to have more opportunity. So this is a sample of the kind of graph that we would use to identify peaks in demand. So this is around skincare. Um, and we can see here this high, the highest yellow line here is um, generic category skincare search. And that's from the end or from the start of January all the way through to the end of May. And you can see the explosion that happened here. And um, so we identified this. We were able to monitor it week over week, which gave us pretty close to real time view of what was happening in that market. And we decided that we were going to go heavy here. Um, we also used other markets. So Italy was a great example of a market that wasn't all too dissimilar from ours that was in a more advanced stage of lockdown. And um, they were uh, roughly two to three weeks ahead of us, if not a little bit more in terms of the restrictions that were happening. Um, and while we did see the same trends for skincare, we also saw that hygiene and toiletries were increasing at the same level. But um, categories such as tanning and makeup were slowing right down for obvious reasons, no one was going out. Um, but the key learning here was that there is a lot of information available and predictive insights from developed markets that are going through the same kind of circumstances, but are a little bit ahead of it. So we really leveraged those to inform our decision making here and to give us an idea of what we can test. Um, and then we matched that demand to product sets that we had available. So um, within skincare, we identified that the biggest opportunities were across the likes of moisturizers, skin treatments, serums, anti-aging and acne treatments. Um, how that then matched up to the, the customer journey. So we did expand that upper funnel search um, and we utilized our in-market audiences to target people who were expressing an interest in the skincare category. And we used the Google display network um, and Google shopping, um, smart shopping to also market to people at that very generic stage of their search. Um, as they moved to consideration, we used website visit audiences that we had built um, around both the skincare category and other categories on the site. Um, and then we also targeted more refined keywords for people who are getting a little bit closer to what they wanted in the product. And that might be going from moisturizer to moisturizer for dry skin um, or a similar kind of refinement of a keyword. And then as we moved to the purchase stage, we were really strong on brand to make sure that we were getting all of our USPs across there and remarketing um, to customers who had visited certain categories and not converted. So we're remaining front of mind. And then there's that retention piece that follows up for post-purchase. And you can continue with that non-converter remarketing also. Um, so the upper funnel search with skincare in mind here, um, we did see a large chunk of very profitable revenue come directly through the skincare campaign. But what was interesting was we also saw significant incremental revenue come through other campaigns and channels. So we could see that brand was really sticking in people's minds. And as they had visited the site previously and not converted, they came back and you'll see this a lot. And they came back through direct channels where they maybe had bookmarked a page or through a brand campaign where they searched directly for the brand. Um, and we could see that that was driven directly from that initial generic skincare campaign. 
Um, so we also prioritize smart shopping. Um, and the reasons we do that is that um, we can target people at all levels of that consumer funnel. Uh, so from research in their generic search terms, down to consideration and through to conversion. Um, and smart shopping allows us to leverage the audience data that we've collected and also set ROAS and CPA goals to ensure that we're remaining profitable at all times. And the results that we saw, this is smart shopping specifically, but by utilizing those audiences, prioritizing high margin and product and uh, strong deal sets and retargeting really strongly um, across non-converters. So we saw clicks rise by 60%, CPCs dropped by 27% because of that really granular targeting. Um, conversion rate grew by 58% and that's because our messaging and our page was relevant to the consumer we were going out to and the CPA dropped by 54%. So um, an overall for that period, revenue saw a times 2.5 increase for that campaign compared to the period previous. So that would be March through to June compared to November through to February. So you can see immediately the impact that that level of retargeting will have. Um, so spend was being used much more efficiently and traffic was being driven. And those audiences are a permanent asset to your PPC accounts that you can continue to leverage. So the investment is quite long lasting. When we look at how we remarket using those audiences, so as I mentioned, we use two different types, web visit and in market. Um, and the conversion rates for web visit audiences are significantly higher than what you'll see um, on pretty much any other higher funnel um, audience or your overall conversion rates for the site. And um, we saw double the conversion rate come through these web visits. And then when you look at in market, they're also well above um, your kind of average that you would see across desktop and mobile on a retail site. So you can really see that these are valuable um, asset for you to have. And when we look at bidding on brand, um, so you can see here a sample from Mahers of why we do this. So uh, bidding on brand allows us, we know that a lot of people when they're coming back to, to um, convert are going to Google for the brand directly. And this will allow us to channel them to specific areas of the site by giving them good site link extensions and um, that they can go straight to skincare or Simprove. They, we also can uh, mention our USPs, such as our free delivery, uh, click and collect or free samples. Um, and we can really tailor that if there's a, a promotion going on and that we can include that messaging there and maximize our click through. Um, you're also protecting your brand and dominating search engine results pages by doing this. Um, and the CPAs tend to be extremely low for this kind of campaign. And it does give us that, uh, that flexibility to tailor messaging. So what were the results that we saw from all this? So overall, we saw three times more revenue come through the Mahers PPC account um, for March through to June compared to the previous period. And I think it's really important to remember that the previous period did contain peak. Um, so these results were absolutely phenomenal. Um, and spend increased by just a third. So you can see that our return was absolutely like out of the water here. Um, the 54% 50 decrease in CPA was seen, as well as a 33% reduction in CPCs and clicks were increased by 106%. And this is all down to granular targeting and understanding your consumer and making sure that you're there at key points in that journey um, and remaining front of mind as a brand. So at this stage, I'm going to hand back to James for the Q&A. And um, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much, Lisa. Or Alice, apologies. No, it's not our day for screen sharing today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, with that, we will jump straight into our Q&A because we don't have a huge amount of time left. Lisa and Alice, thank you so much for that. That was fascinating. I would say every day is a school day, but now this really goes down as a big school day because we learned so much there. There was so much in that. I, for one, will definitely be going back and watching the recording again. So um, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. So we'd like to welcome for the Q&A, Lisa and, Al and Alice, obviously, are joining us, and Una O'Hagan. Um, everyone should have their mics off now. You should be able to hear us. Do you want to say a quick hello, Una? Hi. Let's check our mics. Out. Yeah, you're there. How are you? You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for your kind words, James. Not at all. You're very welcome. And thanks for joining us. Like we said last week, one of the things we like to do is have a retailer here. It puts a bit of manners on us to make sure that uh, we can back up what we're saying. Um, and 
Una, you in particular, we are so pleased to have you here today. So thank you so much. And it's a special day. Should I even say it's a special day? A birthday day? I'm, I'm sorry now. I probably shouldn't have let that cat out of the bag. Um, 21 again, same as myself. Um, Una, it's something people don't often know about Granby Ireland is that we actually have one pharmacy, a retail pharmacy down in Camp Pyle in County Wexford. It's a gorgeous all-care pharmacy. It's there since the 1940s. Um, and we're, we're lucky to have it. So when we, during the beginning of COVID, we got to see, I suppose, at first hand, what it meant to be in pharmacy at the beginning of COVID. So like as an essential retailer, um, you know, sales were through the roof. That's fantastic from a retailer's perspective. That's super. But we had healthcare providers and retail staff in an extremely vulnerable position when the rest of the country was locked down for their own safety. Um, as an owner of a pharmacy chain, can you tell me a little bit, what was that like and what is it like now that we're out of the eye of the storm a little bit and looking back on it, uh, what are the learnings from it? Yeah, it was really difficult now, James. And um, the first thing I would say is whilst we were so grateful to be open and to remain open and, um, and, I, I, and my heart went out to so many retailers that had to close their doors, it was far from easy. It was um, really a very frightening time, a very scary time uh, for our teams because you can imagine People were really worried about pharmacy closing. They were worried about not being able to get their medicines. And so people in, in I suppose, March were coming in en masse looking for maybe two, three months of prescriptions, really panicking. Um, and the thing at that time was um, because there were so many people coming in, probably coming in early, even though they might have collected their medicines a week before, um, we had so many vulnerable customers and patients in our pharmacies right beside um, people who were displaying symptoms of COVID-19. So it was a very scary time, not only for our staff personally, um, because we didn't know actually who, who were testing positive and who weren't because so many people actually obviously didn't display any symptoms. So it was scary from, for, for them, but they were so frightened as well for our customers because they knew by looking out over the counter who you know, was maybe going through cancer treatment or who were going through, you know, had a, a, an underlying condition, maybe COPD or whatever. So all I could say is it was absolutely um, so scary. And I, I, I want to acknowledge, and I know none of my team are on here today, but just to acknowledge not only my own pharmacy team, but actually pharmacy teams around the country, we really stepped up to the plate. And I suppose, even though we remained open, James, um, it was a really strange thing for us because we were almost immediately thinking safety first, safety of our customers and safety of our teams. Because a lot of our teams were going home, some of them had underlying conditions themselves, and a lot of them were going home to family members who might have been going through treatment and whatnot. So even though we were open, we were nearly switched our message into, we're open, but don't come in, which is so unusual for a retailer to be saying that because you're always trying to drive footfall, of course. Um, and that's where the beauty, I suppose, of online came in for us. Um, and thank God we had it. And thank God we had it set up um, as, as well as we had logistically. And just to recognize our partners, DPD, and in terms of doing that, um, because we would, we would have been lost without them. So very quickly, what we tried to do was really to tell our customers, don't come into us, we'll come to you and shop online. And for some of the stores, we even turned off click and collect because it was unsafe for customers to come into, like for example, the Matter Hospital, we couldn't take customers into the Matter Hospital. So, but we were using our online platform really to, to, to make sure our customers remain safe and to make sure our teams remain safe. So really we, we put a huge focus onto online for the purposes of that. So, and, and thank God we did. And I suppose the one thing I would say is out of all of that, we, we started to put things up online that we would never have up online before. You know, Alice and I think uh, Lisa talked about margin. What the product profile quite um, succinct, I suppose, and not have everything up there because, um, well, we can't afford to have every single line that we would have in the pharmacy up there and hold that in terms of cash, you know, in our warehouse. But not only that, it is about margin for us and it's about having the right products up there and keeping the profile quite small so that, as I think it was Alice who said it, that the shopping experience is it's not too clunky and we don't have that page load speed um, problem because every single product you have up there, you have an image up there, you have a video up there and that uh, um, slows things down. So, but we, we found ourselves that we had to put things up there because we were trying to keep customers at home and keep them safe. So OTC medicines, we increased that obviously, and essentials that we would never normally have up there, you know, so whether it be, you know, toothbrushes and toothpaste and stuff like that. 
and that was really basically to give our customers an opportunity to buy it online um, as opposed to coming into us or even going to a supermarket or wherever they would normally purchase that. So scary, fearful, but we're very grateful we remained open. We're very grateful um, to our teams stepping up and for pharmacy teams all around the country, I think it's fair to say we went over and above, um, but it was, it was frightening. There's no question about it, it was frightening. Thanks so much, Una. Thanks for that insight. And I have to say, you know, because we are, you know, we have our toe in the pharmacy business, we, we could really see that you were out in front at the beginning before the, before the government and the HSE had all of their messaging quite pulled together. Yourself and other pharmacists were out there answering questions on Instagram Live and things like that. And I think it filled the gap that was there. And it was a real vital public service at that time. So well done. Um, we have some technical questions more on the digital side. So I'll probably throw some of these to Alice and Lisa. Um, what have we got here? So what is the typical, and I should say as well, a couple of people have asked specific pharmacy questions. We won't be able to answer necessarily those, but we'll answer in a general way, looking at retail overall. So what is a, what is a typical conversion rate you see for an omni-channel retailer? And what's the range you feel it should be in? Um, I'll take this one, I suppose. Um, so for omni-channel retail, I think it's really important to separate out, especially if you want a click and collect service, your conversion rate online for home delivery, and then your click and, click and collect um, rate. So again, I would look at what your click and, click and collect offer is. Um, if that's taking payment online, then perfect. If not, you need to look at that separately if it's a reservation system. But as a rule of thumb, I would say if you're over 1.5% overall, you're not doing badly. Um, there's definitely scope to continue. Um, and if you're hitting the 2% mark, you're doing quite well. Um, and again, you need to look at your mobile and desktop separately there and make sure as we move more and more into a mobile world, that that's where your focus is and that you're starting to both match and exceed your desktop conversion rate. Um, but definitely between the 1.5 to 2% mark for me would be a, a good place to be. Great. Thanks very much, Alice. Um, question for Lisa. Lisa, in your presentation, you showed us an A-B test for Eurochange, I think. Um, yeah. Was that A-B test, so it's two questions. One, one came in on the chat, is, was it done on Google Optimize? And another question was, one I had myself was, at what point do you get statistically valid results? Like how big a sample do you need? Um, yes, it was done on Google Optimize to begin with. And second of all, I suppose when it comes to the, your sample pool, it depends on the level of traffic that you're currently getting to your site. So we'd always look for a minimum of 1500. Uh, but you should be, you know, you should be kind of tailing at that anyway. You'd usually get that then over, you'd let it run for about a week, week and a half, and you can start to see a breakout between which one is winning and, and you present from there. Okay, thanks very much, Lisa. No uh, I'm conscious, folks, it, it is four o'clock. We said we'd finish now, but we have some more questions. So if you don't mind, we'll keep going just for a few more minutes. Um, this is another question for, uh, I'd say it's for you, Alice, as well. What's deemed a good retail AdWords ROAS? And I know you mentioned profit ROAS as well, which is a very good watch out. But in terms of ROAS itself, what would be a good range for retail? Um, I mean, how long is a piece of string? Really? Um, and this is why it's key to understand your margin and to leverage that. If your margin, if you're in tech or CE and your margin is coming in at an average of 10 to 14 percent, it's going to be tight. Um, but as your ARPs are going to be a little bit higher there, like it, it really does depend on your margin. Um, if you're looking at making, like say, to give you an example, if you're selling a laptop and your margin's 10% and you sell it for a grand, um, so you're making, you know, 100 euro off it. Um, if you're spending more than 40 quid for that conversion, you're going to start getting a little bit tight. So, um, but, but again, it really is category by category. And this is why it's vital to segment your product offering and look at each of them separately to make sure you're maximizing across the board. Super. Thanks very much, Alice. Um, we have some other questions here that have come in through the, through the Q&A. Did you implement any, and I know you did cover some of these in the presentation, but did you implement any specific changes or optimization during or as a response to COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on, Alice, far away. I'm just taking all these, Lisa. <laughs> we are okay. <laughs> I mean, um, as, as I kind of went through in, in some of my slides, looking at those um, markets like Italy um, was key for us in identifying what categories um, were going to perform well. 
And a part, a large part of that was expanding on those campaigns where we may, you know, before have only been targeting a, a few products or a more granular set of products. We then expanded that massively in reaction to that. So being able to see that um, that, that demand was likely coming down the line, we expanded those campaigns in reaction to that. And within that, then we leveraged a few of, of the strong brands, um, the, the stronger brands, I suppose, that, that were available. Um, so absolutely, yeah, a lot of it was reaction to what was happening in the market and then reacting to, I suppose, the demand. If demand was really high, we could kind of um, pull back on that on that ROAS goal um, and try and make it work a bit harder. Um, so, yeah, I think the key thing throughout that super like really fast changing um, period is to be watching your data really, really closely and then reacting as soon as you can and uh, testing and pulling back then if necessary because I mean you know everyone who works in digital marketing knows you have a great idea it doesn't always work and um, so being aware of that and then pulling back is really important if something isn't working and that's going to really protect your spend and make it work harder. And just to feed into that then as well James the front end we would have seen um, messaging around COVID obviously up front and centre was very important at the start um, but we do see as the phases are moving on, people are moving out of it and we're getting used to this new normal, that having that up front and centre, they don't want to see it anymore. To, you know, when we've done a few A-B tests and removing that message, that strong message off the front end of a site and versus having it subtly within, you know, your, your tabs of your website, um, it converted much better as well. So, yeah, again, just you know, working with the markets that you have. COVID messaging fatigue, I think, I think we all suffer from that. Yeah. Um, a, a question for yourself, Una, on the kind of operational side of things and managing these peaks and troughs of, and probably more peaks really, uh, through COVID. Um, we would have experienced ourselves, I see our, our e-commerce manager, Ashing, is on the call and our team would have had huge pressures and stresses and, and, and stresses in keeping our orders flowing, adding on extra shifts and like that, um, because we're in essential retail for the farming products. Um, it was like that peak would never end. How did you manage that? I got two questions, I guess, again, how did you manage those peaks and troughs? And did you see orders coming in? I'm guessing you did from customers you never thought would buy from you online or customer segments. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, I'll take the second bit first, James. You know, we we seen a big shift on um, our age profile of customers. So we would have, you know, customers that we would never would have thought um, would ever shop online. And I'm talking about like my mom and her, you know, her friends and stuff. That 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 customers subset that really were really scared to actually come out of at at home. And when government restrictions came in, even in the whole, if we can even rewind back to cocooning and and that language, I mean that seems so long ago now but whenever they themselves were cocooning and yet other people were actually out and about they had no other choice other than to shop online unless they could get someone to actually deliver things and and there were so many people who actually weren't didn't have people to drop things to them so they were migrating online where they never would have tried that before um so definitely um there was a shift in demographic there um and then your second question was really um, about how do you manage these peaks and troughs um it is literally about the flexibility of the team and i mean thank god we have such an engaged um team in mars and they would go over and above or whatever and like they worked long hours and long shifts and chain shifts and you know we send people home whenever we you know we knew that they were exhausted and you know it was literally we were trying to match them and we, we could have thought that we were going to have a quiet day and we'd have to pull people in and and i guess it's I suppose we had a lot of store staff as well who we were pulling into online as well. So it was it was never ending and it was just changing by the hour and by the day. And and I guess it came down to communication of that to the team and just saying, we don't know what's happening. We don't know what's going to be like today. All we know like is what we know in the morning. And and it was shoulder to the wheel and everybody getting stuck in very much so. And, and just making sure that they were recognised and thanked and acknowledged for the lengths that they went to because it was... You know, it was a whirlwind. It was a whirlwind. Great. Thanks so much, Una. I think we're we're almost out of time. We might do one or two just quick fire ones. I think these are for Alice and Lisa as well. Uh, a quick one. If certain categories are highly competitive and have a high cost per click, but a relatively low basket value, are you better just not do a campaign at all for those? That's always a tricky situation to be in. Um, and the higher the competitiveness of the market and the bigger the, the I suppose, the competitors you're going up against, it is going to make it hard. 
Um, but using those automated bidding strategies like ROAS or CPA. Um, so even if you set you know, a really um, ambitious goal, if it's at all possible, Google is going to bring those conversions in, it is likely you won't get your spend away. Um, so if you have a budget for 200, but you can only manage two conversions, you're not going to get the spend away, but it will bring it in at the goal that you want. So that's a great way to test if there is any sort of point, I suppose, in entering that market, um, which would be what we would recommend trying. Um, and then also building out those remarketing, um, those, those remarketing audiences and leveraging people who actually are familiar with your brand. Great. Thanks so much, Alice. I actually won't ask any more questions because I'm just looking at the time and, and we have kept people beyond when we said. But thank you so much. So apologies to anyone whose question we didn't get to. Um, if we have your name, we'll try and follow back um, to you. Uh, just if I could say a quick thank you again uh, to our panelists, to Lisa, to Alice, to Una for joining us. We really appreciate it. Everyone has given up their time both to present today, but also to prepare for today's presentation. So we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We have one more webinar left in this series. That's next Thursday, same time, three o'clock. And we're going to be speaking to Paul Keeley, from Tony Keeley's and Connor Cochran from Social Media Elite. And the presentation is on how social media ads can drive in-store sales and how you track those results. And it is a case study as well with, um, with Tony Keeley's. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your time. Have a fantastic birthday, Una. I hope you're going off to do something much more exciting now. Um, and thank you all so much. And we'll see you next week. No problem. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks all.